This is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network, now in its eighth year of talk like you've never heard it before. we go out to the west coast to san francisco california the home of my birth and of course larry bubbles brown who wasn't born there he's an I was, in- yes i was yeah I, we both fled our birthplaces apparently yeah yeah only you were you let's see you were where were you born ohio ohio yeah. and um uh, let's see here i've been to ohio once i was there when i had a girlfriend there and I, yeah, and you had a girlfriend in Ohio? What, wow. What, what, no, well, uh, you remember uh, Xanthi? She moved out there. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, in Cleveland. Right. Yeah, and so I went to visit her in later years because she moved there. And I, um, uh, you know, so that's the one time I was in, in in Ohio. And Cleveland's not a bad town, you know? No. Uh, David Tell said he played Dayton, Ohio. He said a fun thing to do in Dayton is pack up and get the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, I agree. I probably that's true. You know. Uh, but uh, so anyway, so how's everything out in California? Sid? Good. Uh, no earthquakes. I think we're safe for a while. Uh, I think we're getting into fire season, so that's always. Uh, Did you have a brush fire in the hate? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> That'll be next. You know, uh, what are people going to say? You know, maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe global warming has something to do with all of this. You know, they had a, they had a flood out in, I think it was Texas, that is one in 1,000 year flooding. It only yeah, happens. Yeah, I heard one, about that. Yeah. yeah, once every 1,000 years. You go, what the fuck is that all about? You know? And, and they're the first ones that go... Oh, by the way, I came up with an idea. You're going to love this idea. So you, the, you do know what the governor of Texas has been doing to New York, don't you? With the uh, immigrants? Yeah. yeah, he's been packing up the, the, um, the Mexicans, basically, the immigrants, and putting them on buses and then shipping them to New York. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah. He, he, he figures that's a wonderful idea. That solves his problem. Okay, so uh, so they send them all here to New York. By the way, they don't all get here because along the way they all get off at other destinations. <laughs> they just get off the bus. So that by the time they get here, if you got a bus of 50 people, they had one arrive here with six in it. Uh, but anyway, so his idea is to send us all these people. And so I got an idea. Now, uh, who has... If, if you compare the Mexican immigrants to the homeless that we have in New York, okay, you know, the ones that sleep in the subways? Mm-hmm. Some of them don't even sleep in the subways. They actually sleep in the subway tunnels, right? They're like whole wow. whole, whole communities underground <laughs> here in New York. Well, what we should do is we should take those people and ship them to Texas. <laughs> Good idea? <laughs> Much rather have those immigrants here. This country is just such a dystopian nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't write this stuff, you no, know. Pe- like in the seventies, you said people were sleeping in the subways. You wouldn't believe it. Right, right. Well, there was a song called "Don't Sleep in the Subways." I think. Petula, Petula Clark. Petula Clark. You're right. See, you're very good at this. You're, you're terrific. You know. 1965. <laughs> you're, you're swell. Yeah, 19, <laughs> you even got the year. Yes. Jesus. You know, anytime I need a year or something like, when was I doing something like this, uh, Bubbles? He would then give me the year that we did it. <laughs> you know. Well, oh. well, I, huh? I, last night I watched this show that we talked about a couple of years ago. I didn't like, and now I love it. So, um, 
What? Oh, 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 excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. It's allergy season here, too. Well, yeah, that never goes away from me. But, but anyway, what were you going to say? A, a movie that you didn't like that we didn't like? A series like. that I didn't, I didn't like when I first saw it, and you liked it a lot, uh, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Yeah. It's good. I like it. I like it now. Well, how do you see it? You don't have Netflix or uh, uh, Amazon. I, I, my sister does, though, so I saw it up her place. Oh, so you go over to, you go over to other people's places yeah. <laughs> to, to kind of binge watch shows that you don't yeah, get I said, because uh, I said let me take another look at this thing again I liked it so yeah no it's a very it was a very, it's a very good show third season and eh, not as good as as the others but it's still good show you know and one of my favorite people in it uh, Kevin Pollock yeah 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 uh, nice to see Kevin getting nice work you know after all these years, because you would have thought by now, you know, I'm not saying this because he isn't talented. I'm just saying this because this is the natural attrition of show business. He should be washed up by now. He should be washed up. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. You hit, uh, I remember uh, when he hit 50, Robin Williams told me, boy, the uh, movie offers have really slowed down. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? That's exactly what I'm saying. But somehow, you know, he's always been in there working you know he's always been going well, out for the jobs and he's always been plugging ahead and uh well character actors can sometimes last a little longer yeah is he a character actor i guess he is i would he? say so he's been he's done so many small parts have been so good he's funny in everything he does well you know that's what you, people go well gee i, I want to be a big star well you know what i'd rather be i'd rather be a, a, a character actor who gets employed every day of the week yeah, absolutely. You know, and character actors, on the whole, last much longer than the stars do. I mean, how many stars last a lifetime? You know, I mean, we have a handful of them. But when you talk about those character actors, different story altogether. I mean, Kevin Pollack, if we looked at his credits, I imagine they go on forever. Oh, yeah, he's probably done 70 movies. What was his first Hollywood credit? I think he was in the um, the Lucas one of those. Oh, 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 oh! Yes, he did do that first. Yeah, the sequel to one of the sequels of Star Wars. No, it wasn't. The title. No, it wasn't sequels to Star Wars. It was uh, the uh, thing about the 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 midget. Um, oh, I'm trying to remember the name of the of the, of the movie, and he did it uh, with. Uh, um, oh God! I'm my mind. Forget it. I'm. I'm quitting the business. I can't remember anything. Was it anymore. Rick Overton? Rick Overton was in it, and they both played little people about the size right, of. Right, I didn't see if I heard about, about it. About an inch then, high. Yeah, Willow. Willow was. The Willow. Picture. That okay. That was it. And then his uh, first big break was uh, '88 Avalon. That's right. Right, and from then on, he was working. He constantly, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think he maybe had a certain portion where there was a little pause. You know, I think everybody in their career goes, well, maybe this is it. You know, maybe I'm washed up now. Uh, I, In fact, I keep saying that every day. Washed you know. <laughs> up. But the, the problem is, is when I say, am I washed up now, most people will say, you were washed up years ago. You know, so. God, I forget who the... There was a famous actor who said... Uh, he couldn't stand it because even when you got known, you still had to audition. You're always scrambling for work. You know something? Um, who was it said it to me? I think it was Chuck McCann, who you don't know, and nobody knows now. He's dead. Uh, but he was an actor, and he he said to me, he said, you know, the problem is that every time you sign out from a movie, because like when you're through with a movie, they have you like sign a thing. I'm through here. Goodbye. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that that's you know terrific and all of that, but he said you don't know if you're going to get another job, right? And I said, but you know you work all the time. And he went, you just don't know if that isn't your last job. Patrick Stewart, I had him on the air in here in New York, I guess on Sirius XM, and I, at the end of the interview, I said to him, I said. Uh, well, by the way, next time you have something else, uh, be sure to come see us again. 
right? Because I enjoyed the interview and I wanted to have him on again. And he said, well, I will if I get another job. <laughs> really? <laughs> and I'm thinking, this is Patrick fucking yeah, Stewart. Yeah. <laughs> this is a guy who should be able to go home at night and go, hmm, which one of the jobs shall I take next? You know? <laughs> you would think. <laughs> and he was insecure about it. And I, so I brought it up. I said, you insecure? He said, every actor's insecure about that. You don't know that the job you're doing now isn't the last job you're ever going to get. Uh, I mean, he since has made hundreds of movies and stuff like that since I had that conversation with him. But, you know, I mean, there are, it, it's a very, people in show business, very insecure. Very insecure. I'm insecure. You yeah, know? no matter no matter how big they are, they're always insecure. Yeah. Well, now I don't worry about my next job because I know there isn't one. <laughs> uh, Me too. <laughs> I just worry about my health, you know. <laughs> We've accepted our fate at this point. Yeah. So anyway, so I, you know, um, uh, but I, yeah, I've gotten to the point where I, all I'm doing, all I have to, you know, you have all these things when you're young, you have things to look forward to. Oh, Bobby's having a birthday party. All right. You can look forward to that. Oh, it's my birthday next week. Yeah, I can look forward to that, you know. And then as you get older, it's like, uh, I think I can get, I think she'll have sex with me, you know. <laughs> That's, that's still something to look forward to. What else do we look forward to? We look forward to a new job or whatever. When you get to be my age, the only thing you have to, you have to look forward to is death. <laughs> and when, uh, and also learning about another friend that's died. <laughs> oh, another friend that's died, or somebody is is giving you a near death experience. In other words. Doctors, you know, when you're young, doctors will go, eh, it's just a wart, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, but when you're 82, they go, might be cancer, <laughs> you know. So the whole the whole dynamic changes, and and it's it's kind of it's depressing, you know. I mean, I just had to go around with a bunch of doctors. Uh, when I went, I went in for you know, I went in for that emergency thing that I told you about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did every test known to mankind. You know, it was almost a adopt. It was almost a divining rod for cancer. You know, uh, and they found something in my lymph nodes that was questionable. So after it was all over, they told me. Um, get a hold of these people over at Mount Sinai. Uh, they are hematologists, oncologists. Now, I don't know how those two things come together, but apparently <laughs> they do because there are a lot of them, all right? Uh, uh -huh. So uh, I, I said, okay, I'll get a hold of them. Well, it seems as though they also got a hold of them and said, you know, this person is going to be contacting you and this is the information. Here's all the tests we did, blah, 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 blah. So now I call them. And they say, well, we'll get back to you. And they get back to me and they say, well, uh, you don't qualify. I said, what? I don't qualify for. He said, for us to see you. Now, I never had this happen before in my life with a doctor. Have you ever called a doctor and said, I want to see you? And they say, well, let's look at your situation. And eh, we don't want to see you. But no. it wasn't explained to me properly. So now I'm at my regular doctor's. And one thing leads to another, and he says, you know what you need to do? You need to go find a, uh, a hematologist, oncologist. He said, uh, I said, well, you know, I was turned down by the ones at Mount Sinai. He said, what? I never heard of that. So go see this guy. Now I'm thinking about it. Do I want to go see this new guy who's a hematologist, oncologist? Or do I do, uh, what, what do I want to do? So I called back to the hospital I had originally called earlier. And they said, oh, well, I remember that case. Yeah, uh, your doctor at the emergency room sent us some stuff. And we they looked at it here. And the reason they couldn't see you was seeing you wouldn't do anything because you don't have anything. In other words, they looked at my blood work and said, the only thing that has to do with the lymph glands would be lymphoma. You, you don't have lymphoma. None of the blood work even indicates it, and that's why we wouldn't see you. 
would be a waste, you know, basically what they're saying is be a waste of our time and yours. So now I'm thinking I got this appointment to go see this other guy who's an oncologist, hematologist, and what's going to happen there? Uh, And, uh, you know, why should I go to them if this other one, which are better because they're the ones at Mount Sinai, they're the ones I would, they would be my go-to people first, right? Uh, They they turned me down because I didn't have anything. So I'm going to go to this other guy and he's going to now have to do all the tests that Mount Sinai already did on me, like draw blood and do this and do that. And I finally said, ah, forget it. I'm not going to that doctor's appointment because it would be redundant. Yeah, like why didn't they just tell you we can't see you because you're okay? Couldn't they have said that? Well, they, 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 they did say it, but I don't think I heard it that way. Basically, she said, you have to have cancer before you can come see us. And I Jesus. said, but, you know, uh, I want to find out if I have it. And they, uh, But she didn't say to me, but uh, they've decided that you don't. She told me this time that the results were that they looked at my blood work and everything. While certain things were a little high and so on, there was nothing there to send up red flags saying that I had uh, uh, lymphoma, as an example. So that was, that was that. But, I mean, I went through all of that. And all the anguish. I mean, I was waking up in the morning going, I'm going to die. You yeah, know? the anguish, God. You, you know, I, I haven't got more than another three months before I'm gone. <laughs> so today I, I was going to call my doctor and just tell him I'm going to cancel the appointment. And he's on vacation. Okay. Sure. The nerve going on vacation. And so I just called the other guys and said, uh, listen, I'm going to uh, cancel my appointment and I'll call and remake it if I need to. So, you know, I'll call my doctor next week and tell him what I did. But, you know, I mean, it, it, he, he would have to agree that me going to this other doctor would be simply redundant because it's the same kind of doctors that turned me down. Yeah. You know. But that's the kind of thing you go through as you get older. You're spending your whole life doing this kind of stuff. And in the old days, you go, eh, it's probably just a wart, you know. Uh, so, but... You probably find that's happening to you. They they get a little more suspicious of everything that happens to you. Oh yeah, I got uh, I got a mole now. I'm worried about. So I got to get that checked out. And 20 years ago, I wouldn't have thought twice about it. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not hungry lately, so I'm worried that I'm dying of something. You know, I mean, it. it look, I mean, the one thing I guess we're never going to escape in this world is death. And it's the one thing you and I fear the most. <laughs> you know why I think we fear death? I think it's because we don't have any control over it. You know, why can't I live forever? Where's the science? Come on, I'm living in a scientifically perfect age. You should be able, you've got cancer, zap, your cancer is gone. You know, but no, we haven't gotten that much better, you know. Yeah, I think you're right. The uh, it's a loss of control. Like uh, you'll be dead. Somebody else will be putting your body in a box. And yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I've I've said this over and over and over again, and that is that that um, uh, you know that that I my, when I asked my father once about death and my fear of death, he said, "Don't be afraid of it. You've already been there." And it was before you were born. Right, right. You know, same void, whatever. You know, and then I suddenly started getting paranoid about what it was like before I was born. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Dad. You know. That certainly makes me feel better. Uh, So, I mean, I, I, you know. but uh, And he went, your father went fairly young. He went at 59. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, you know, when I passed 59, I went, well, I'm in gold now, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, he, and today he wouldn't be dead. That's the thing. Well, he'd be dead by now. But he wouldn't have been dead uh, then because he died of a pituitary tumor. And in those days, they couldn't get to a pituitary tumor. In case people don't know, pituitary is, if you, if you, 
put a put your finger in the middle of your forehead and then put your finger in the middle of the top of your head where they would intersect is where your pituitary is and to get there was impossible without you know cutting out you know memories of yeah. your prom or whatever you know so uh, it, it, he died of a pituitary tumor uh, today and then about a couple of years later I'm going out with this woman and she said, well, you know, I had, a, I had a death scare a few years ago. I said, oh, what? And she said, I had a pituitary tumor. I went, what? You know, immediately, I, my ears perk up because that's what my father died of. And I said, well, okay, you had a pituitary tumor. That, that, that's, my father died of that. She said, nobody dies of it anymore. She said, they found really? a way to get to it. They found a way to get to it. Jesus. And it's up through the roof of the mouth. So oh, that would work, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they go through the roof of the mouth, they go get the pituitary tumor, and nobody dies of pituitary tumors anymore, unless, you know, maybe they went too far and they didn't do anything about them. Uh, so so there are things that, you know, we've completely changed, and I, I always felt bad about that because I really love my father, and I went, why couldn't he have gotten that pituitary tumor five years later? You yeah. Know? So, I mean, there are a lot of people who die of things that, you know, we should be able to, we should be able to solve, you know. Didn't even get to give Social Security. Uh, you know, he never did. You're absolutely correct. And I, yeah, there was Social Security back then. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. Me, on the other hand, I've cost the government a fortune. <laughs> yeah. You bankrupted the system. Well, you know, I didn't bank, you don't bankrupt any system because throughout your life, you pay into Social Security. Yeah, you know. So the pot and they, huh? and they still they still tax if you work after you retire. They still tax your social security. Even. Oh yeah, they don't say, "Hey, here's your social security. It's tax free." Okay, if I I'm right at that level where if I make a couple of bucks more than uh, the social security, in fact, I do because I have a uh, after pension, uh, SAG after pension of about 900 a month or something like that, but that puts me over the top. So, you know, we, you shouldn't have to pay on Social Security. What no. is this? And then, and then they got this thing called Medicare, and it's like $190 a month off your Social Security to pay for Medicare. What is this? Right. I thought it was free. Yeah, that's a big misnomer. It ain't free. Nothing's free. They, it's it, You know what it is? It's an American attitude that nobody should get anything for free you know even if you worked your whole life for it you know I mean we should just take care of old people come on you know another and I think it was in England if you're over the age of 65 once a year the government will send you to another country on vacation really yeah you can go to France on vacation they pay for it you know, That's nice. because well, because they respect their older people. You know, thank yeah, you. Yeah, we're so the much. only country that we hate our old people. <laughs> oh no, yeah, forget it. I I know what it's like to be hated being old. Nobody cares about me. I I, I once said I said this when I was uh, sixty five that when you hit sixty five, you disappear. Yeah, you know, you're you're invisible to other people on the street. You know. No more l long, loving glances from good-looking women. <laughs> well, we didn't get those when we were young either. But Yeah, if you give them a glance, they then charge you with, I don't know, whatever the current in thing is to be charged with. But it's, it's amazing. It's just amazing. God. Ah. Uh, I, I think life sucks. I think so. I'm not sure. Right. You, have you made it up your mind yet? It definitely does, yes. Yeah, it definitely does suck. But I've had a good life. You've had a good life. Think about it. You know, what's miserable about your life? Don't yeah, no, it, don't, it, don't it, answer it, that one. Could have been worse. So. Don't, don't answer that one. Otherwise, you're going to go into your comedy routine. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Hey, listen, we've run out of time here. We have. Yes. Uh, Want to do it again next week? Sure. Well, if you didn't want to, you're going to have to do it anyway. It's the Unless law. Unless I die. <laughs> Unless you die. See you next week, Larry. See you, Alex. Bye-bye. 
This is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network, now in its eighth year of talk like you've never heard it before. And there was Larry Bubbles Brown. We all love Larry, don't we? Huh? Huh? We love Larry. We love Larry. He's the most miserable human being on the planet, but we love him. We love him. We love him in his misery. Anyway, let's see. I'm, I'm trying to decide. Should I wear the hat? Hat on, hat off. I don't know. Uh, if it gets a little hot in here. It's been, it's been, this has been a brutally warm summer. Okay? So, what the hell? There I am complaining. Well, it's time to let some people in here who have, uh, have decided that they want to be part of our uh, uh, our group here and uh, we only have a couple of people here first of all Josh Wheeler is there and uh, 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 somebody special for me tonight um, because uh, he is uh, he is uh, how can how do I how do I describe you this is a man who has fired me what three times well twice and I'm looking for another opportunity <laughs> twice yeah he, he actually got to fire me twice and a lot of people don't have that ability you know uh, God. you know it, it was a mistake both times yeah. that's all I can tell you this is Ed Cramp ladies and gentlemen I'll, I'll admit it to you he, he, and below him is Josh Wheeler and uh, Alan is calling here and um, uh, uh, Ed, just you just uh, you just uh, were inst installed into the uh, Bay Area Hall of Fame, right? Radio no, that's on, that's on uh, September tenth. Oh, okay. And so, and, and I have to tell you, if not for you, I wouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. Why is that? I think we accomplished something pretty spectacular during the times we were together. Mm -hmm. uh, we broke new ground. Um, we did innovative things. It's probably the last innovative thing that's ever happened to Bay Area radio. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, it, it, it sucks. It sucks right now. You know that. Well, radio everywhere sucks. Uh, you know what? I, I do a little Spanish radio. I manage a, a very famous Spanish personality, and it doesn't suck in Spanish radio. Really. It's still, it's well, still compelling. The audience is there. Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't know. I can't understand what they're saying. You know. Yeah. So. Well, neither do I. Yeah. You know, why do you say it's compelling in Spanish broadcasting? People, are, because uh, it, it's a couple of years. First of all, it, there's a lot of syndication. Mm -hmm. uh, you take a guy like Ryan Seacrest in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. He's only relevant in L.A. He doesn't translate anywhere else in the country. Uh huh. Spanish broadcasters, whether it's Los Angeles. Salt Lake City, New York City, Miami, yeah. Philadelphia. Yeah. I mean, uh, acculturation, education, um, immigration reform, it, you know, it, uh, healthcare. It's 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 all local issues to them, and and they're all concerned about it. So I think it's yeah. And and and, and the guy you the guy you the guy you manages. What's his name? Eileen. What's his name? Eileen. Eileen. And he's he's one of the biggest in the business, right? He's in the Hall of Fame, and you should be too. Well, uh, you know, I, I forget, you know, I, I, I got to tell you about these Hall of Fame deals. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I don't like it. I, it's okay if a bunch of people get together and say, "Hey, uh, Ed Cramp, you are a great general manager. Let's put you in the Hall of Fame." What? Where's that? Sound? Where's, that where's that sound coming from? Uh, anyway, uh, you, you know, you, you should be in the Hall of. Wait a minute. Let me just let me do something here, okay? And let me bring it back up and see if we still have the same problem. Okay, we don't. Uh, you know, if they just say, "Hey, you know, Ed Cramp was a great general manager. Let's put him in the Hall of Fame." All right, that's fine. But now instead, they turn it into a contest. Oh, I didn't play. I didn't play the contest. Yeah, I should have been in there ten years ago, based on what I've done and how many stations I've run and a lot of different things. Uh, it's it's very political, and you're absolutely right. And well, I didn't. I, 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 was, haven't the game. I haven't played the game. You know, I was nominated for the broadcast national broadcasting hall of fame. Yeah. And on the same group, in the same group, was uh, Sally, Sally Jesse Raphael, for instance, right. and a couple of other people who were very deserving. Who won? 
this team from Philadelphia because they got all their people to write in and and vote for them. You know, I mean, it, it was just it, it well, was ridiculous. They didn't deserve both, it. They absolutely people, didn't deserve it. Both people on the nominating committee, I know very very well, and one of them I actually work for now. Oh, really? Give it a little time, you'll be in the Hall of Fame. Oh, okay. <laughs> They better do it soon, you know. I I, 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 I understand, but you know, the, the clock is ticking away. I, I, I get it. I understand. Yeah, I haven't, uh, I, I haven't seen Ed in years and years and years. But we do every now and then cross paths and uh, talk to each other. And uh, he was, uh, he was one of the uh, the most important general managers that I had. You know. Yes, uh, Kevin. Yeah, you're oh. not broadcasting on. Oh, I am broadcasting. I just haven't. On put YouTube, in. yeah. I, I, you are, but just you. Yeah, I didn't on the YouTube. There we go. You got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We uh, we we didn't have what happened was I didn't put everybody's pictures up at the same you didn't time. Didn't flip the switch. Yeah, I'm getting old at this, you know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I got your back. Yeah. <clears throat> but. Uh, uh, yeah, well, you know, they, they, I, I uh, you know, I, it didn't bother me that I didn't win, but you know, because I, I it's just, you know, I've had a good career. You, know? you should be, the, you should be in the Hall of Fame. Oh yeah, I, <clears throat> in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, okay, there's no doubt about it. Singularly, in my experience, and which, I work with, which one? I've been in the business 43 years. Yeah, with all the greats, and you were behind the microphone, the most talented individual I ever witnessed and watched, you know, work and, and, and do it. Well, you know something, I got to, I got to tell you, I, uh, I, I did a, an interview the other day with a guy who uh, has listened to me for a year, for years and years, and throughout the interview he kept referring to me as, where well, you have the legend, Alex Bennett, and I, I, the word legend really bothers me. Because I, you know, call me a legend after I'm dead, but while I'm still above ground, hire me, you know. Uh, and um, what was really interesting was today. What is that? Where's that noise coming from? I have no idea where, 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 where it's. it's uh, any of you people have anything up and on? Do they have a browser that's open? No, no. I guess everybody's fine. It, it sometimes it, it happens very, very frequently. Uh, anyway, uh, today I, I talked to somebody I haven't talked to in years. I worked with him at WMCA in New York, and he's over the years been a good friend. And uh, his name is Malachi McCourt. Uh, mm -hmm. You know who he is, right, Jeff? Yes, a little bit. And now, if I if I'm going to tweak your me memories a little bit, if any of you ever read a book called Angela's Ashes, <clears throat> which won Pulitzers and Nobel Prize, I run all, Fra Frank McCourt wrote the book, and it was about he and his brothers uh, growing up in Ireland, and uh, and his mother, and it was made into a movie. And I, I've known Malachi for years, and I just love Malachi. And today I talked to him. He's 91 years old. And he's in hospice care at home, uh, and uh, he says, I'm dying. And I, I looked up a thing of him where he was on the cover of this magazine. It says, Malachi McCord is in hospice and is dying. And when asked if he fears death, he said, not as much as I fear Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of guy he was. But anyway, I so I talked to him today. So today's a day for me to catch up with old friends and so on. So you're you're doing a little bit on the management thing, right? You talking to me? Yeah, yeah. I I, I out of work radio guys are consultants, so that's kind of what I do. I yeah. still need to work because I was one of the good guys in the business, so I didn't steal from anybody. So I still need to work. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I'm not. I can't retire. Uh, I live in a retirement community, though. Yeah. Oh, you do. I live, live, near, I live near Palm Springs. Oh, okay. So, you, but you live in a retirement community. Well, Palm Springs, Indian Wells. Uh, you're you saying that most people that move there are retiring. What yeah. is that yeah. noise coming through? Josh's ring I? lights up when it. Who, when what the light? Who's who lights up? Josh's ring. Josh's. Ring lights up. Ring around the picture lights up. Yeah. Okay. Well. 
Let's see what happens. See if it, see if it continues. <coughs> well, uh, uh, it's great to see you, Ed. If you want to stick around, I'd love to have you stick around. No, I want to stick around. You know what I want to introduce you to? Because uh, uh, you you were at uh, you were at my wedding uh, almost thirty seven years ago. Yeah, that was hey, where. Come over here, Zach. No, you have to come over here. You <laughs> <laughs> like it or not? Wait a minute. I, 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 yeah, I was just at his wedding. What did he say? Thirty-five years ago? Seems like just yesterday, right? Thirty-seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thirty-seven. Well, who were who were you going to show me? Kim. I was getting my wife. Your wife. Yeah. Yeah. Still she married. Needs buy, she needs to buy a new dress before she comes on camera. So. Oh, I see. The yeah. same wife after all these years. Well, I was married before her. Yes. Before, no, I was, at, I was married before her. I don't know if you remember, but I was married for uh, three years, 10 months, eight days, and seven hours <laughs> before, I, met, before I married Kim. Oh, before you married Kim. And then yeah. you had this wedding, and it was out by the water, and I remember, you remember, you remember, I remember the ducks. while yeah. you were doing the, the <laughs> vows, right. there were two ducks, literally, in the pond, fucking. <laughs> Right. Yeah, and 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 yapping up a storm too while they were doing it. So I figured that was a good that was a good omen. This this is this, I mean this has been great. And she's you know have uh, my oldest one, who was uh, from a previous marriage, just had a baby. Yeah. I'm a grandfather of two now. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, you know. I'm just trying to do what everybody else is doing. Yeah, you know, just yeah. Trying, to get, trying to get along and, and 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 figure this whole thing out because it's it's a shit show out there. Oh, is it? It's a, oh. it's a total shit show out there. Yeah. Politically, uh, media, social media, the whole, the whole nine yards. It really is. Well, you know, you know me. You remember I'm Mr. Technology, right? I know. I, I finally know. decided that it's all evil. You know. It is. You know that. That if things can be invented for good or they can be used for bad, and somehow we have this ability to go out and use them for bad, you know. And uh, I mean, hell, I mean, you would think. Well, that remember, remember the sex and mail you used to get all the complaints from from advertisers and listeners. Yeah. And those all those fucking groups that were waiting for you to say something so they can. Yeah, but at least you got sex and mail. You know? Yeah, I, I understand that, but I can imagine what it would be like today, with uh, with Twitter and uh, and everything else going on. Plus, you you'd have to be sending out Instagrams and doing these videos and all this other shit, and I would have had to pay you more. That would have been a problem for me. Yeah. Well, I just you know, I it it it's it's not the business today that I signed up for. I you know how I love radio. I love I know. radio. I know. You know. I know. And uh, I do this. But this isn't exactly radio. <laughs> but, yeah, but you are, you are, you, you, you can still do this, and this is what well, you do. Yeah. Look at folks who come and, and listen to you, and uh, and as I go around wherever I do, mm -hmm. and and they fucked up Live 105, as you know that. Now, now they uh, first they took Live 105. That was a station that he managed and that right, I worked right. for. And, and the owner's son was a guy who they they brought out for the summer. Remember that he was yeah. working for us for the yeah, summer. Yeah, he now is the president of the big, biggest right. broadcasting outfit. Well, it's been delisted. It's second, number two. So what he did was he bought the CBS radio stations. His, his, his father had no debt, right? Yeah. He bought the CBS radio stations at the time he made that deal three years ago. The stock price was was sixteen dollars. Okay. Uh, today, I know it was a bad day on Wall Street, but today the stock price is at, and I need a drum roll for this, 54 cents. 54 cents? Jeez. Yeah. So what they did with Live 105 is they had to change the name three years ago from Live 105 to Alt 105.3. That would have been like Coca-Cola changing their name to RC Cola. You know what I mean? I mean <laughs> Then that doesn't work, obviously. So they changed yeah. the format to David Dave FM or something like that, right. where it's now being run out of a broom closet. You know, no jocks, all that other stuff. We play what we want, all that other shit. Um, 
I mean, that's what they did to that brand that you created. And this guy did an unbelievable job creating a brand, live morning show. Uh, he had a ball. Well, a, I, th I think <laughs> I, I've said this, and I think you would probably will back me up on it, that I was talking the other night about Odyssey, which was <laughs> Intercom, and, and the fact that uh, uh, they, it, it, the typical of what happens in this business, your stock goes down or you're not making money. So rather than fire the people at the top who are responsible for that, they fire the people at the bottom first. You oh, here, here's, the, here's, <laughs> there's here's their stock. Here's their stock in terms of what's going on. <laughs> yeah. you know? and, and yet all the senior executives, the cumulus and everything else, they get these $10 million golden parachutes for fucking up the whole business. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and then they it, go and they fire an on-the-air personality because they can't afford them. Well, what happened was, and this is, uh, are we live somewhere where I'm going to get in trouble for this? Oh, sure. But, but okay, nobody got, nobody listens to this, so don't okay, worry about it. The, the CEO of uh, iHeartMedia, uh, the former uh, yeah. uh, head of uh, MTV. What's his, yeah. what's his name? The uh, Bob Pittman. Bob Pittman. Yeah. yeah. So before the pandemic, Bob Pittman comes out with this statement about radio. During the pandemic, radio is going to do really well because, uh, you know, people will need um, companions and mm. radio stations and radio uh, have, com you know, the, the companionships and they have the companions. Mm -hmm. And that was really an astute comment that he made. The only problem is a month later, he fought, he fired all the companions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By, by the way, this this, this podcast is on iHeart, so oh, well, uh, take, take it off. <laughs> you have to edit this out. Oh, we, uh, yeah, yeah. That's but no, I mean, I, I, it's not. It, look, it's not his fault. These guys just paid too much money for these radio stations, and then they justify. Yeah, but who allowed them to buy all those radio stations? They, you know? it, it was like. The, it was it was it was the greater fool theory, you know. Yeah. David Beal, I could do better than CBS. I mean, there was a time for people who don't know. There was a time when you could only own what six AM, six FMs, and five, oh, that's right, yeah, yeah oh, five boy. five TVs or something like that. And then all of a sudden they threw that out the window, and all of a sudden mm -hmm. iHeart, which at that time was Clear Channel, bought up twelve hundred radio stations. Yeah, and I work for I work for those people. I. Re I actually ran 280 of them, by the way. Well, I worked for you for a short time. We tried to do something with that station, and uh, you know, you, you, you know. Well, you remember who was the head of talk radio for that outfit? Uh, I'm trying to remember his name now. Ken but, Cole. Ken? No, no, no. Um, uh, oh uh, Hobbs. Hobbs. Yes. Hobbs. Yeah. yeah. This guy is the guy who said to me when, when I said to him. Um, you know, you, why aren't there a lot of liberals on talk radio? He said, well, the definition of talk radio is conservative. He, he literally felt talk radio meant conservative talk. And Well, you know, I, I put Air America on in San Francisco. Yep. Okay. And, um, and to be hyper-local, I put Willie Brown and Will Durst on in the morning. Mm-hmm. Making it real with Will and Willie in the morning. Yeah. And then what I did was I took a page out of your book. I had a live studio audience from so some from a ho a new yeah. hotel across the street from Willie Brown's office. Mm -hmm. Had coffee there, the whole thing. We tried to do the live one five. First, first thing was no one showed up. The next thing was, <laughs> the next thing was he he cut the ratings in half from Al Franken, and uh, so nobody bought in that he was a liberal. And and the station just sucked. But the but, but I changed the format because they paid me a million dollars, Air America, to do it until they ran out of money. Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, and and the guy I I fired, talk about horrible things I did, was cable radio, which is the station that we moved that to, was Jim Lang from the Dating Game, who was right. playing nostalgia and doing really well. Right, the sweetest guy in the world. Oh yeah, you know, no, because what, 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 what happened? This is interesting, guy, everybody. Uh, yeah. it, it, when I wor he worked for him for a short time with Clear Channel, trying to just do some kind of talk on this station, uh, and 
they, in the, the, they finally became clusters, and every radio station they owned was in the same building. You know, before you did, you had your station in one building, and then the the competition was in another building, mm -hmm. and the other competition was in you know across town. Now your competition was next door in the next room to you, and uh, my well, studio is right well, next to Jim Lang's studio, and we would get together during the the commercial, the news breaks, which would take about ten minutes between that and commercials, and we just start talking. And it turns out, did you know that Jim Lang was a wild-eyed liberal? I mean, he was just, you know, who would have thought? He's a great guy. And great by the guy. way, great his, guy. Wife, his wife, Nancy Fleming, was Miss America 1960. Oh, wow. Is, is, is Jim still alive? No, no he passed no. away about seven, eight years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yes, uh, yes, uh, uh, <laughs> Alan. Mm -hmm. Is there any concern? I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. Not that I'm looking for this. Is there any conservative radio talk shows? KSFO is the only one. I wouldn't listen to it. 560 KSFO. Um, I've heard of them. That 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 that's it. That was that was. I mean, San Francisco. That, I wouldn't think that that conservative talk show would last very long. Well, what what you what what people don't understand about San Francisco is. San Francisco has only have 750,000 people, but there's nine Bay Area counties and Contra right. Costa County. I think they're still hanging black people in Contra Costa County. <laughs> so it, it's pretty, no. you know, I mean, it's, that's, that's a whole different area than San Francisco. Right, right, right. Uh, and San Francisco's as much as people think about it, it's, it's only the fourth largest city in California. It's, it's people think it's a lot larger. Yeah. And, uh, oh, no one has kids there, obviously. And, and well, we uh, have a friend of the show here who lives in Contra Costa County. Uh, I don't think he's racist, but he's definitely a Republican. He's definitely a Republican. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, I, I mean, when I went to Sirius XM, at least there was a place where, you know, you could, you could, they had varied politics, because you know they had. 200 radio stations. Talk about having your competition next door. He was sitting in your lap while you were doing your show at Sirius XM, you know. So. But the but the good thing was uh, well I don't you had you had advertisers, right? So the advertisers couldn't boycott you and screw you, you know. I I was uh, Right. You know, I mean I work with Dr. Laura Schlesinger in Los Angeles. She got me fired in LA. What ha what happened to Dr. Laura? She's on Sirius XM. Is she really? Uh, oh yes, they did hire her, didn't they? Yeah. yeah, they did. Yeah, but nobody. She may be on Sirius XM, but you don't hear much about her anymore. I mean, Alex, she was, she was a, one of the worst people I've ever met. I've heard heart. that. I've heard that. Yeah. yeah. I would tell her that to her face if she was on the call tonight. If she was, mm -hmm. you know, and and you know me, I'm not, I'm, I'm not like that. But I don't have animus. I'm a happy guy. I don't have any negative shit about anything in my life, uh, but her. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's one I there's one I could tell you a lot of stories about. <laughs> oh boy, I'm telling you. Uh, oh. Yeah. But look, I, I'm 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 going to tell you one other story, and then I'll I guess I'm sorry I'm dominating this whole thing. But yeah. The, the the difference between running one radio station, which is what we did with Live 105, okay, right. and the, the story, no one's ever heard this story, and I've never told this story. You know, the reason I left and the reason I was so unhappy at the end was because um, the station was built on a false premise. I changed the format without telling the owner. I know, it was a great, and, it was a great story. They kept hiding the fact that they had changed yeah, but, the but, format from the owner. But but if you want, but if you know me, yeah. when I talk about I'm an honest guy, I have credibility, I have integrity. To do that always really bothered me. So while everyone was having a good time, okay, remember I was I was cleaning up all your shit in the morning. I mean, you guys yeah. would have a good time at ten o'clock. Then I had to deal with the Chinese for affirmative action, <laughs> Bay Area lesbian and yeah. home, you know community, and yeah, right yeah. now would be LGBTT. I, 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 got so much, I got so much goddamn <laughs> trouble. And then I was always 
defending Macy's cancel, calls Jr. cancel, all this other shit. So I was like Mr. First Amendment, just telling everybody, you know, what Alex meant to say was yeah. it's what he meant to say was. Uh, uh, but but what but running one radio station was we had a, uh, a, a dinner with Schwartzman on a Monday night. It was yeah. 1987. Right. Okay. Alex will tell you about his thing. And it was spectacular. We did it at the Fairmont Venetian Room, Dick Bright's orchestra, comics, the whole thing. I mean, it was great. It's a good old fashioned like, radio program. Yeah, it was like yeah. the Jack Benny show. Yeah. Because that's who he kind of models himself after anyway, with, with a lot of his with a lot of his stuff. But uh, anyhow, we flew ten media buyers in. Oh yeah. Oh oh God. From LA, right? LA. So I'll I'll, I'll tell you the story, yeah, right? Yeah, right. So, tell it. It was a PSA flight that I had booked them on, and they were coming in on the 3.30 flight on Monday night. And now, because I'm running one radio station, not 300 or 10 in, in the Bay Area, I'm saying to myself, hmm, let's see here. It's like Wednesday or Thursday, I'm saying, I don't know. Yeah, maybe I'll move them up a half hour or so. I, I, you know, they're going to get to the airport, then there's traffic. we got to get them up to the Bay Area, this, that, and the other. It's the Christmas season. So I move them to the three o'clock flight. Mm -hmm. And I did that on Thursday, like a last minute move. Yeah. Then I made sure they all knew this. Okay. So all of a sudden we're at the event on Monday night and we're waiting for our national reps and some media buyers to come up from LA. And we hear that a plane went down, a PSA plane went down north of Santa Barbara. And my first reaction was, holy shit. I just kill these people. How the hell am I going to live with myself? And then about 10 minutes later, the limousine pulls up with our people in it. The flight that they were originally scheduled on is the one that crashed. Yeah. Oh, shit. Wow. And it was, it, it, was a, it was a hijack, too, is what it was. It was a, an, an ex-disgruntled employee who got in there and, and you know fought everybody and, and pushed the plane down, you know, and it crashed north of Santa Barbara. Almost everybody in the plane died. Yeah, everybody. Fact, everybody. Everybody. Wow. Everybody's everybody. So we almost thing. killed off all our advertisers. <laughs> Absolutely. You but know, but save their lives. Yeah, but, but the point is, if I was running 10 radio stations in the Bay Area, like I did the last time I was there, mm -hmm. those people would have died because I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought about that. That would have been something that was on my mind. Yeah. You know, to, to do that. Now I got lucky because tell them one, I, tell them one more story though. This is the one that I love. Is the time that I, I defended Sam Kinison. Yeah. Because somebody said, "Oh, he's homophobic and blah blah blah," and I said, "No, he's not." Well, this is this is where I do think you have the left a little wrong because I remember you going in there. So what happens is we're promoting a Sam Kinison concert. Yeah. And. Uh, a glad, which would stood for what uh, gay and lesbian, Bay Area, uh, 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 lesbian alliance, it whatever. Was, yeah. So yeah. they want they wanted to meet with us. So they came into the office, my office, and it was like eight or nine of them. And each one of them was, I'm Nancy so and so. I'm with the. It was like the Palestine Palestine Liberation. So it was like different factions of of the of the of the Bay Area gay community, all in my office, right? Right. And they were and they were. I would describe them as... But they were also complaining about me because I was defending... That's right. Sam Kinison. You were defending Sam Kinison. So they wanted to come in there and talk about gay bashing and this, that, and the other. So what they did was they assembled a five-minute tape <laughs> which of the horrible things that Sam Kinison was saying about gays. And it was the tape of the best and the funniest shit that ever came out of Sam Kinison's mouth. Yeah. And they're playing this in front of me, Alex, Richard Sands. The program director, um, um, yeah. Lori Thompson. Right. But right. The, two, I, the two of you are trying to suppress your laughs. You're like I, holding it was the hardest. I, I, I say this was the toughest and hardest day I ever had in radio because I took this really seriously. I want to respect this group, their community. I'm, I'm there to serve the community. You know, they could file on our license, right? And I had the toughest time. Like they're playing this stuff, and it's like, and I'm like, like this, I'm <laughs> coughing and sneezing. It's right. The best of. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So they they play this tape, and it was, I, it was it was incredibly funny. 
I mean, I didn't even hear these bits before. It was a great <laughs> comedy mixtape. Right. <laughs> that they thought was going to be like, here's example number one about how horrible he is, this, that, and the other. And Did then, you have well, here's, here's, the part, here's the part of the story yeah. I never got yeah. uh, after it was over. And that was at a certain point, I stood up and I said, you know, you're no different than a bunch of Nazis. That's I right. said, That's I don't you. care what the cause is here. I've always been gay positive. Uh, I've always been a friend of the gay community. I don't have to sit here and defend myself, especially right. to a bunch of people who are trying to be censors. I said, so you can all go fuck yourself. And I That's got right. up and I right. opened the door and I slammed it shut behind me. He left me there with those people. After <laughs> then, then he wonders why I had to fire him. I gotta be, I gotta be respectful and responsible to the community in terms of my job, and, yeah. and that's what he did. So you look but, good to these people, then, right? Who me? Yeah. Well, you had to figure out what they really wanted. Oh. And. Alex and Bed. Well, well, we basically no. said no, no. We basically said to him, "Thank you for providing me with this information." Uh, you know, I didn't know a lot of this stuff about what's going on in the community and all this other stuff, and I really appreciate it. But we're going to promote the goddamn concert, okay? And you're, and you're not here to tell us what we can and cannot do. But here's what they got out of it. They got an hour show on Sundays. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Wow. And, and, that's and, what and also want. later on, they got $5,000 out of me because... I, I got into some kind of promotion where if I lost a certain amount of weight or met a certain amount of right. goals working out with this gym, that they would give me $5,000 to give to the right. group of my choice. And I gave $2,500 of it to GLAD and then Glad. the other to Meals Without with Wheels or whatever. Right. And, right. and But th that was uh, that was my proudest moment when I walked out on those people. You, you, you did really well with that. And, and again, that was... Uh, that's all they wanted. And then in 2001, 2002, I actually created a show called, because I was working for Clear Channel, mm -hmm. I created a show called Queer Channel. And, <laughs> and, and somebody got to host it. Yeah. And we, yeah, we did the gay pride parade yeah. and everything else. But I'd still, but you know, the, the problem with that community is, it's like, you could agree with them 98, 99%, 95%, but the 1% you don't, you're yeah. a fucking bigot, you're a racist, you're homophobic. Listen, if you and, want to stick and around... Come, and they come, yeah. after you, come after your ass anyway. If you want to sit around and talk with the rest of us, fine. But if you want to, if you want to call it quits, you, you can do that too. I, 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 I will do that. I just wanted to come by and say hello to you. I love you. Well, let's also, yeah. let's also yeah. keep in touch, okay? Since you've got Zoom and i got Zoom, we can Zoom so, each other. I'd appreciate it if you wrote something for me that, that somebody could read on, on September 10th. That would mean a lot to me. What do you mean? Is that the... As, as, that's when I'm being inducted. I mean, and something, my, something uh, from me that somebody okay. could read about. Well, you. or a video, or a video, do a video. Do uh, a maybe I'll video. do that. When's it? The tenth. Yeah, the tenth, and I'll, I'll I'll do a video. It, it's interesting. You and Don Blue will be doing videos. Oh, Remember that? That's okay. Kind of <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, right. Just to, you know, but as I said before, there would be no Hall of Fame for me without you. Well, thank you. And, and then the other thing is, is that. I had the cheapest boss in America that I worked for. And the only way I was able to hire him was to convince the company that had him on probation because they were having a contract dispute. Mm -hmm. They paid 40% of his contract. Oh yeah. For his remaining four or five years of his deal. Yeah. It was like- Well, you did, did a foot, you did a foot, foot, football kind of thing or a, a, a baseball, baseball kind of thing, kind of thing <laughs> where yeah. I had a, a certain amount of time left on my contract and you said, the deal you made with them was if I equaled the kind of ratings that I had gotten at the other station, once I did that, they wouldn't know they you know they wouldn't owe me anything. You would pay all of it, and they didn't want to go for that deal. And in the first rating book, I beat the rating. Yeah, but they yeah. they were paying forty percent of your deal. So yeah, and I, I'm laughing to the bank, and and they think I'm the idiot. Yeah, and I I I literally I literally was getting paid by two outfits. Right. I got plus. Yeah. How we hand, how we handled Macy's and Carl's Jr., which is a lesson everyone should learn. Oh. We stood up we stood up to the bill to the bullies. We we didn't yeah. we weren't intimidated by it. Yeah. Yeah. We he just went on the air and said Well, no, here was here was the deal. Yeah. Let me just tell the story quickly and uh, then I'll get on with the rest of our show here. Sure. Uh, what happened was 
uh, somebody was writing to Carl's Jr. and a bunch of other advertisers, uh, and it was the, oh Carl's Jr. was getting a lot of a lot of mail from people, but it turned out it was only one guy who was going all up and down the state mailing his letters from different places. So all of a sudden, Carl's Jr. wants to stop advertising on the program. So I just said to you, do you want to let me loose and take care of this myself? And you said, go ahead, have at it, because you were mad at him. Well, who else would do? Who else would do? And who, I went on the air and I told I told the audience a story about Carl's Jr. and how you know somebody who I never heard of and they never heard of they believed and and decided to stop advertising on the program and on the radio station. And so I suggested to my audience that they buy their hamburgers somewhere else. Within about a week, the guy who owned all the franchises in the <laughs> Bay Area called me up and said, what, what, what's going on here? I'm losing business on this deal. And I said to him, well, I don't know, but Carl's Jr. canceled because of these people, blah, 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 blah. He called Carl's Jr., he was one of the largest franchise owners that Carl's Jr. had, and said, what are you doing trying to kill my business? Yeah. You start advertising with Alex Bennett again, and they were back on. And they never and you left. Did that, you did that to Macy's too. You did the same thing. Did I do that to Macy's? I didn't remember that. Well, yeah, you did it to Macy's. You never. Uh, you I, have, I often. You, I, might, have it, you I, might have done it on White Powder Day for Macy's. But yeah, but the thing is that I always felt that you never let an advertiser intimidate you because if you do, then they'll all feel they can, you know, and then you're up to your ass in problems. But that's that's the problem now with media matters and a lot of things. They're trying yeah. to censor everybody. But anyhow, guys. Thank you. Nice Great talking you. to you, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll be back. I'll, I'll call you, and we'll we'll figure out when I'm, i got to write this thing for you, okay, or write, or do it. Do, or a, do a quick video for me. I'd appreciate it. Okay, great. Nice well, meeting you ladies all. Ladies and gentlemen, Ed Cram. Thank you, Ed. We appreciate hey, it. Hey, Alex, take care of your health, all right? Be good. Yeah. I'm, we, I'm, we need you around for a while. Yeah, I'll try. Okay. Right. Anyway, um, so a, a little little history. I guess you you must have enjoyed that, Kevin, because that was part of your. I remember it? Yeah, I remember you mentioned him a bunch of times. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great guy, and a, you know what can I say? A great guy who fired me twice. You know. So, yeah. You know. Um, by the way, Josh will be doing another show tonight, so uh, you should all join in. We will. Uh, It'll take me about five minutes to set it up, and then uh, <coughs> he'll be here doing his little thing, and it'll go out over uh, uh, Facebook, my Facebook page, right? Good job last week, Josh, by the way. Thank you. You seem to be enjoying yourself. Yeah, it went good, smooth. Yeah. Plenty to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Filling for Jack, give people their hour back for... You know, is it my, is it my imagination that this whole affidavit redaction thing was a big bunch of nothing today? That's all CNN could talk about all day. For Christ's sakes, a bunch of black lines. Yeah, but there was nothing there. You know, nothing. No, that's I'm, what I mean. I'm, that's all they talked about is eighteen pages of black lines and fifteen pages of mixed documents. Well, I'm sure that all the stuff that was blacked out probably was interesting and, yeah but and, and would have nailed they're it not gonna give that away right right and i don't know what they expected more of but they, that's all I, I had the tv on but i was in and out of the house and i just walked by and that's all they talk about all day long i walked by and it was three hours later and same thing different guy well i figured i would go back every now and then and see if they had like read more of it or something and that there was more to nope. it, and no, there wasn't more to it, you know. No, nope. no. Nope. I mean, it was like getting a bunch of black lines. It was pretty much what they knew they were going to get, and yeah. they got what they thought they were going to get. But they're and sitting there on pin, pins nothing. and needles. Oh, it's going to be released any moment. It's going to be released any moment now. Yeah, and they got eighteen pages of black lines. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you're. You, what do you expect? I mean, they. They got what, they, yeah, they, they got knew their, they, they knew they weren't going to get anything, but they're, 
they weren't going to say, by the way, there's going to be a document released in 30 minutes. It's going to tell us absolutely nothing. I mean, that that's not how they were going to advertise it. So it verified I, what they thought they were going to get. Was, if, if there was, uh, yeah, I mean, if there was any informant or anything like that, they obviously weren't going to put that name out. That's right. not how it works. Well, that's, so you weren't going to get much. I mean, my understanding from it is there was a slight bit of information, you know, that obviously wasn't helpful to Trump, you know, and the count and the classification of, of the documents, right. you know, none Clear of which mind. was, uh, none of which was good for him, but that's, that's really all, but, but, but that's but not all, really, but all those numbers were from the boxes he turned over, right? I don't know. I thought, I don't know. I'd have to go. I think it was a combination of, I thought maybe it was what they confiscated, but maybe it maybe it wasn't. Maybe they're not even done going through that yet. Somebody today know. asked asked uh, Biden as he's walking out of the White House, uh, 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 "What do you do with documents like that?" He said, "Don't even ask." He said, "Nothing like that," you know. I mean, he he yeah. Just, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a process to that type of stuff. So the, I, we talked about it last week. There's not really any type of defense for that stuff. I mean, for the people who say, well, you know, the president can he can declassify anything he wants and all that. I mean, that's but he can't. That's like a ha that's like a half truth, I guess, because even if it is true, but there is after that, there is still a process that happens, you know after that i mean i i last weekend i was working on research and i sent it to kevin and patrick you know i i i think i don't really think anybody else knows but they knew that in this period of time that i'm working on this big project i got into a program to get a, a graduate certificate in, in world war ii study so i started it a few a few weeks ago or whatever and there's a pretty big project coming up and as part of it you have to do a lot of writing and i'm going through uh, some primary sources, and and part of the ones that I I got a hold of that I'm going through is sort of the personal papers of Admiral uh, Chester Nimitz, who was the commander mm -hmm. of the Pacific Theater of World War mm -hmm. II. And I have it's a it's scanned in a PDF of the original papers. It's the original papers. They were all in a notebook, and they're online now. Mm -hmm. And every single one of them at the time was marked top secret, secret, all that. And as soon as those were declassified and, and released in like 2000, someone went through every single document and they marked out the secret and they had a note written there about who did it. Every every single one of them, the, the top secret is crossed out. I mean, I have a couple of pictures. I'm like, that's how it works. Someone went through every document, marked out the secret, et cetera, et cetera, so that if anyone is found with this document, it can be it's it's noticed or you can prove that it's legitimately been declassified that's the same way if if you put in for a FOIA request for example Freedom of Information Act and they decide to declassify something that you can now have that's that's what they will send you they will send you a copy that is a, a scan of the original it will cross out the secret the top secret the classified whatever it has and that's how it will look it, it's not just as simple as saying Oh, it's declassified now, and I can, you know, take it home with me for forever. I don't have to. T I mean, he's not going to have any defense for that. Well, Whether it, it goes anywhere or not, we'll see. But there really isn't a defense. For well, that. I mean, I think he did something highly illegal in that he confiscated government material. You well, know. that is that is illegal. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, you know, he, that's what I'm saying. Is this the president can declassify anything he wants? And no telling it's, how many it's staples. Like, it's a half it, truth. Yeah. But no telling yeah, how many right. how many staples and paper clips he stole when he left too. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 a it's a it's a half truth, and you know, a couple hundred documents or something like that. I mean, this isn't work from home stuff. This isn't. I took it home. I mean, yeah, sure. On my way home tonight, yeah, I, I have three hundred batch tickets I took home tonight. You know, from my workplace, by the way, that are proprietary uh, uh, information. You know, I, I thought I might show them to PPG. Or <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not. You know, there would be no defense for that. You know, I mean, it would it would be. Um, you know, you don't work here anymore. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and we're talking about, you know, something that the other side probably already knows anyway. They don't need anything from us. Uh, in my case, but so what we're talking about here is, you know, important items of security, military matters, intelligence matters, and stuff like that. And, you know, this is the same stuff that he hammered other people for, you know, I mean, yeah. at, you know, and, and I was against other people doing certain things. You know, I, I was never a fan of Snowden or, or anything like that, you know. So, I mean, I'm being fair about it. I mean, he's the one who's not. It's it's not us. It's well, him. I mean, he I, here's a guy who felt that he became president. When he became president, he had carte blanche to do anything he damn pleased. Yeah. Uh, you right. know, and... and, and, yeah. and Let's face it. Why did he want to be president of the United States? Was it because he cared about the country and that he wanted to change things? No. He wanted to keep getting from getting indicted and sued and all the other things that were almost that were on his back that he would he could at least could avoid while he was president. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, he's a uh, he likes the the things that come with being president: the plane, the helicopter, the the so on and so forth, you know, and I'm sure all presidents do like that. I mean, let's don't get me wrong. Okay? Hey, hey, if I mean, you, if you became president and you got those little perks, you'd love them too. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know. Really, I mean, um, it's a human reaction, but you know, it's that's not really a reason to me to want to be president of the United States. I mean, to me, now there are some people out there who think that it might be, and they are entitled to vote for a person for public office under whatever criteria they deem important to them. But liking the plane isn't something that I consider when I decide who I should vote for. Let me talk about something that that, that is of of great importance and interest to me, and it always has been. Uh, Monday is going to be a very significant day because that's the day that NASA is going to send up the Artemis rocket. And the capsule that is in that rocket is going to spend something like 40 days circling the moon and probably going to be sending back some incredible pictures. I wouldn't be surprised if NASA maybe has a NASA channel where they're going to run those that video you know, twenty four. They do seven. have a NASA channel. Did you not know that? I know they do, but I'm wondering if, if, if they're going to if they're going to run twenty four seven the cameras that are mounted on that on that unit. You know, mm-hmm. uh, they oftentimes do. I think it's like three fifty two on Directv or whatever they do. <laughs> yeah, they do oh, run that stuff. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah, I think so. Let me check. Yeah. Well, I, I'm. <laughs> I'm sure I can also find YouTube probably will be running it live, too. Uh, yeah, the NASA channel is 352 on DirecTV. So. Yeah, well, what is it on Fios? Uh, you know, so I don't know. That I have to look that. I don't know. I have to look that one up. But I, it's right next to C-SPAN, so I've looked through there all the time. But I, you know, as someone who has always hmm. been into the whole space program and everything else, I am just absolutely delighted uh, that this is happening. And uh, SpaceX is going to do their own soon, and China has a rocket ready to go to the moon. So, and they may actually have some people in there. So, you know, it's uh, it's mm. it's getting exciting. And uh, now, if I can just live long enough, I'll see some of it. You know, uh, they supposedly we're going to land people on the moon in 2025. So, I can hardly wait for that because I spent my whole life loving that sort of thing. Um, What's the density of uh, your weight when you're on the moon? The density of what? Of your weight. Of your weight? So you're yeah. one-sixth. One-sixth. One-sixth of what you weigh on Earth, yeah. Wow, that'd be good for me. Yeah, yeah. But you still wouldn't bounce up and down like everybody else. No, probably not. <laughs> no, it, it's one sixth. How do I know that? Because I, when I was a kid, I had all those statistics. I can tell you the distance of planets from the sun. Two thousand five hundred. Four thousand. What? Five thousand two hundred eighty. No, that's a mile. Five thousand two hundred. I used to know the moon too. Yeah. You used to know the moon. The moon is is about. To, 
there's apogee and perigee, and it changes, but the average is 238,000 miles away. Isn't this thing that they're going to launch supposed to go past the moon? What? Isn't this capsule that they're it, going to it's, launch? It's not that it's going to go past the moon, but it's going to get go on the other side of the moon so that you'll be able to see the moon and the Earth. Yeah, I heard within 60 miles of the moon. 60, it's going within 60 miles of the moon, but at its di greatest distance, it'll be something like, what, 40? Not 40,000. Well, wherever it's at today is its greatest distance. Well, no, no. Apogee and perigee are the distance between the Earth and the moon. Uh, at, its, at its greatest distance, I think it's something like 249,000. And I think it, at its least, it's like 238,000. To 232,000, something why don't like they, that. Why don't they put Trump in the capsule? Tell him there's a free golf course there on the moon. <laughs> well, I don't want him going there. Why? That's hazardous waste. Yeah, it's hazardous <laughs> waste. You, you know, I mean, the thing is, what I'm afraid of is that, you know, we've so fucked up this planet uh, that we need to go somewhere else. But do we don't need to go somewhere else and fuck it up too, you know? And I just worry that we're not going to be too good about that. Because, you know, when we left the moon the last time, we left garbage there. You want some, uh, you want some uh, old Hasselblad cameras? What? You can tell Trump he's going to the moon, but he really goes to Mercury. Mm, and there yeah. was game left. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I don't want him going into outer space. I'm sorry. I, I want space to be as pure as is humanly possible. No Republicans are allowed in space, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I guess we got to erase John Glenn then. Uh. Yeah. Well, Glenn, was Glenn a Republican? I can't remember. He was a Republican. He wasn't? I yeah. thought he was a Republican senator or a congressman or something. He was a longtime senator from the state of Ohio. I know because I live in Ohio and I've met John Glenn. And what and he and, was a lot. And, 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 and what and was he, he was a Democrat? Democrat? Yes. Oh, well, I stand correct. Wrong again. Yeah, I mean, what the hell? Not everybody mm -hmm. can be perfect like you, Alex. Huh? What? Nothing. I said not everybody can be perfect like you. That's right. Well, you know, I, I work at it. I work very hard at it. <laughs> You would like, uh, you might like uh, Douglas Brinkley's a historian who writes a lot about the space race. You might like uh, enjoy one or two of his books. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. maybe an audio book when you're walking around or something. He's a he's a pretty good, pretty good, uh, pretty good guy. And he uh, he's written a lot about the space race of the fifties and sixties. A movie I didn't like when I first saw it, and over the years, the more I see it, the more I like it. It was the right stuff. Um, because in the beginning, I don't know why I didn't like it. Uh, it somehow hit me the wrong way. And then after I started seeing it over and over again, I began to really, really like it. Because I think it did romanticize what went on. In, in, and the fact that these people, you know, what we're doing now is, I mean, come on, come on we're sending up morning TV personalities in rockets, okay? Uh, the, the the danger in what we're talking about is been minimized incredibly by the science involved and the fact that we've had 50 years to mull this over before we did it again. And but when those people did it, I mean, look at what they were doing. They were going up in goddamn tin cans with firecrackers on the back of them, you know? Sure. Yeah, I'm surprised uh, that we didn't lose more. You know, I mean, it was, they were, I, I still find it hard to believe that that piece of garbage actually landed on the moon, that junk pile they called a limb. I mean, that wasn't scientifically good. You know, the new, the, the things we're going to land now on the moon are going to be really great because they're going to be able to house people and everything. And yeah, those people, those people were true test pilots. They, they were, absolutely, absolutely. You know, uh, and by the time we got to Challenger, they kind of just became uh, rocket jockeys. You right. Know? Yeah, 
And, and what I hated about it is we never went back to the moon after that. I mean, why do you do all that work going to the moon and then you never go back for 50 years? And in, the, in the meantime, all we did is we became NASA shipping and hauling. In other words, you want uh, something sent up to the space station? You want a satellite put out into orbit? Uh, we'll just send a shuttle up there and we'll push it out for you. They, you know? They've been waiting for you to be in the Hall of Fame. What Hall of Fame? Any of them. Oh, okay. The National Broadcasters, isn't that where your friend's going to? No. Oh. No, he's in Bay Area Hall of Fame. Oh. Yeah, yeah. God, don't even follow it. But, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll never make it to the Radio Hall of Fame as long as it's a, 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 a uh, what do you call it, a, a popularity contest. The guy who's got a radio show or got a syndicated show and can tell people to write in and vote for him is going to beat me out every time. You know, what do I got here? A handful of people who listen to this every night. You know, oh, go vote for me. Okay. Nothing. Yeah, you know, I, I don't believe it's ever going to happen to me. And, uh, well, you never know. Yeah, you never know. You never know. Well, you know, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, I've had a good career. I have a lot of great memories. I did a lot of great stuff. I think I, I, I don't have anything about my career I'm ashamed of. Okay. I think I've acted with integrity and with uh, uh, a certain sense of purpose. And so I, that's all that it matters to me, you know. And if I get some plaque to put on my wall, well, that's nice, but... You know, what, what, what's going to matter? A hundred years from now, does anybody care that Alex Bennett was in the Broadcast Hall of Fame? No. No. You know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm certainly not meant for immortality. But, you know, I, 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 I was talking to, the, to my old friend Malachi McCork today, and I was it just amazed by how many... Did you know about him, Jeff? Did you know about Malachi? No. Not very well. And, uh, you know, a lot of people who are b read books read Angela's Ashes and know exactly who I'm talking about. Mm. But he's, he's as Irish as Irish can be, mm. okay? And even talking to him today, he's 91. He sounded so young because there was a lilt in his voice. It just made me smile yeah. and feel good. Mm. You know? Irish are strong <laughs> bastards. Huh? We're strong bastards. Oh, I'm, I'm, he, oh, he, 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 he was a, he was a troublemaker. He was wonderful. I love Malachi, just loved him. And the last time I saw him was when I was at uh, Sirius XM. I had lunch with he and a guy at the radio station, and I hadn't seen him in years. But we, we both worked together years ago at WMCA in New York, and it was, uh, you know, it was, it was great. It was just great. But he's 91. He's they, they say he's going to die by November, and if he doesn't die by November, he doesn't get hospice care anymore. So I said, that's kind of morbid, isn't it? Yeah, he says, I'm not feeling like I'm going to die by November. <laughs> you know. So anyway, it was... It was the one funny. guy that you mentioned mm -hmm. that I remember very much, uh, Chuck McCain. Chuck McCann, yeah. McCann, yeah. Yeah, yeah Chuck McCann. He was uh, did a t kids' TV show here in, in New mm -hmm. York. He's He's been gone for quite a few years now. Yeah, he started in the radio business. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He started, I think, was it TV or did he, did he do radio? I think it was TV, actually. I think he first yeah. got in the radio, yeah. and then he, he switched. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we're going to take uh, about five minutes off while I set up on this other machine, and... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, you can then call over and Josh will be doing the intersection tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hope that uh, you get more people than I did, Josh. You know, so. But anyway. Any word from Jack? What? Any update from Jack? Uh, yeah, Jack should be home by now. You know, they okay. because it's, it, it, it's, it, the, hosp the hospital is going to kick him out today. Okay. So anyway, hey, listen, thank you so much, uh, Josh. Have a good time. I hope some more people in the call this show will call yours. And if so, I'm going to be jealous. Uh, Alan, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And thanks to, uh, to Jeff and uh, everybody else who's watching. Please uh, call next to uh, talk to uh, uh, Josh.
And all you have to do is go over to gabnet.net and click on the little button there that says call here to Zoom or something. And uh, that'll take your Zoom right over there. Anyway, everybody, wave goodbye, and I'll give a big wave goodbye as well, okay? Bye-bye. And uh, uh, we'll see you again on Monday at uh, uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon on, uh, on Facebook. The show after us will be on Facebook with the video and uh, with Josh. And what was the other thing I was going to say? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> We'll see you again on Wednesday at 10.30. Same time, same station in life. In the meantime, if you see her, yeah, tell her I love her, okay? Bye-bye, everybody.